Hi everyone, it's Sophia from ATA Notes and today I'm hosting the HSC Standard English July Lecture. I'm going to start off with a little bit about me. So my name's Sophia, I graduated in 2021, um, so I'm still pretty fresh out of school and I got a 96.3 ATA. These are some of my marks, um, but because we're talking English, I got a 47 out of 15 extension 1 and a 93 in advanced English. And I'm studying a Bachelor of Secondary Education at UCID. Um, to become a high school English and business studies teacher. So even though I didn't sit um, English standard, I'm studying standard English at uni to teach it. Um, and I also tutor and lecture it. So you can still trust me. Um, and for common mod, I'm not sure if any of you guys did Crucible, but it is a pretty popular common mod text. Um, so that was my um, common mod text that um, some of us might have in common. In terms of how this lecture is going to run, we're going to get through a lot so be ready our first content block one and it's kind of separated into the papers so our first content block is revising the common module we're going to talk about trials approaches and advice for both the short answer and for the essay and our content block two is revising modules a b and c and then going trials approach and advice now as much as i would love to be specific to the text that you exactly whoever's watching um, is studying there are so many different options in standard and it's really hard when we do our lectures to be able to accommodate for everyone so this lecture specifically is general skills and it's generalized it's not like it's just on billy elliott or it's just on common um or it's just on the crucible or just on any specific text it's not just on the curious incident it's on everything um and we're not specifically looking at any text in detail i do have exemplars and paragraphs that you guys can take quotes from um but I'm not going to be talking about any themes or characters or explaining any of the text. This is purely about the modules and it's more about understanding the syllabus and the questions. I'm very sorry, very boring, but because everyone's studying such different texts, we don't want others to miss out. Um, and these are the core skills that are really going to help. So it's more of a kind of study lecture, how to study for English, how to prepare and just understanding the module and what they can ask you and how to be prepared depending on what they do. Um, rather than it is a lecture that's looking at a specific text and here are the themes and this is how you should write it. But I have put exemplars and I have just put like um, paragraphs about Elliot and some of the different texts. So you guys do have some samples if you wanted that. Now how the lecture works, this is recorded. So you can come back to this all the way up until your HSC um, paper one and paper two. So if you have to leave halfway, if you low-key get bored, it's so fine. We're going through so much. Um, so I don't take offense like even if like you're hearing that now and you're like oh, I'm mad like I don't have to be awake at 9 30 to watch it live for example um, it is recorded so you can come back to it and you just come back through the same link on um, the ASI notes lecture website there should be a resource button somewhere I don't know where to point but somewhere there's a resource button on this um, page and if you press that you can download these slides as well so don't feel pressure to write down like every single fact um, and every single point because there's a lot of slides if you want to you can if you want to take notes you can but you're also free to just have a listen and sit in bed and relax as much as possible as i go through the entire <laughs> paper one and two um, and i also will be live in the chat when this is um, put up on the specific date um, so if you guys have any questions english related even if you have specific questions about your text in the live chat that's where I can help you with that because it's a bit just more personalized um, but if you have any English questions any questions about the content as I'm going through it or any questions even just about year 12 early entry studying in general um, if you saw before on this slide that um, any of these were subjects that you did um, like if you're doing business or if you're doing studies of religion or if you're doing modern history as well if you have any questions on those I did those subjects too but we can just have a chat in the live chat if anyone has any questions. So please feel free to ask. But otherwise, we're going to get started. Um, so yeah, no pressure to write notes because we're getting through so much. Making these slides was like crazy because of how much we've packed into here. But we just tried to make the most of it so we can cover as much as possible. All right, let's start with paper one. Um, so section one is the common module unseen text and short answers and it's 20 marks and they say that you should spend 45 minutes on it and section two is your common module extended response again 20 marks and they just give you a single essay question now I know this seems like ugh, especially the unseen text only because it's unseen it's like well how am I going to prepare for that I'm going to show you guys some of my tricks but for this paper when you're comparing it to paper two it's important to remember that paper two, you're writing your mod A essay, 
your mod B essay and then a mod C all in two hours. So two essays and a creative or discursive in two hours. While in this paper, you're doing four to five short answer questions and then one essay in an hour and a half. So this paper is actually much, much nicer. I know, I know there's not a lot of fans of English, but this paper is a lot nicer and a lot easier to achieve better marks on here than it is to achieve it in the later modules, which do get a bit more difficult. So if you are looking to gain some marks, this is definitely the paper to focus on. Um, and especially the unseen text, I hope that when we go through some tips, you can realize that it's a lot easier than most people think. But let's talk about the common module in human experiences because does anyone actually know what a human experience is? Like, like I want a definition. I want a definition because I feel like it's just thrown around so much and we just study it on repeat, but we're never really kind of sitting down with what a human experience is. But let me just tell you from now, anything and everything is a human experience. A human experience is anything that a human can go through or feel. So a human experience can be as complex as grieving a death or it can be as simple as laughter. And in the HSC, one of the questions for the short answer asked about the human experience of laughter and laughing. Like that was an actual human experience in the HSC. And I feel like because for common module, a lot of the human experiences that we're looking at are like power and corruption and redemption and um, forgiveness and conflict. And there's all these really kind of full on human experiences so a lot of us think like oh no human experiences have to be these really deep and like life-changing moments no me lecturing you right now is a human experience you sitting wherever you are watching this lecture right now is a human experience feeling awe, feeling wonder feeling laughter those are all human experiences that they've asked in the hsc um and they're some of the most simple things so don't overcomplicate it it's really important to remember that anything is a human experience if you make it it's everything human experiences. Anyways, this is the common module. So English Standard, English Advanced and English Studies are doing it. Um, it's all about text representing individual and collective human experiences. Everyone's favorite. It's very big on the human qualities and emotions associated with those experiences. And I think one of the most important things is that you're just able to differentiate what's an individual experience and what's a collective one. Now, an individual is when it's simply the character going through it themselves, while collective human experience is when they go through it with others. Now, whether they're experiencing that in a positive way or if they've got a collective human experience and they're fighting and they've got all this conflict, either way it's collective because if it's more than one person and it's got to do with others and it's not just their individual kind of journey it's automatically collective but it is really important just to be able to distinguish okay what theme am I doing that's an individual human experience and which one am I doing that is a collective human experience but I don't want to go too much into this because this is a whole bunch of words the most important parts to take from this is the human qualities and emotions because they bring that up a lot in questions just like they bring up individual and collective human experiences and also talking about the anomalies paradoxes and inconsistencies in human behavior and motivation which um, invites the responder to see the world differently challenge assumptions ignite new ideas or reflect purse or reflect personally those specific lines are so commonly used in questions um, that sometimes you can almost guess the common mod question um, and I know for my HSC we had a really basic one that was nearly stock standard straight from the module um, and these kind of phrases and this wording comes up in a lot of um, essay questions so if you are looking at preparing an essay um, and you are looking at memorizing or just kind of writing like a draft that you plan on going in with and you kind of want some introduction statements or like a topic sentence and you want to make it a bit stronger take a screenshot of this or um, just remember that that the common module um, PDF has it and have that open while you're doing some study and use these wording in your thesis statements and in your practice topic sentences I promise it'll make such a difference in your writing even if it's not within the question there's nothing bad about using the module language that's actually such a good thing and for if anything it's kind of like brownie points in the marking center because they're like oh they're referencing the module like what English teacher is not going to be impressed that you did that. Um, it's really important to remember that, especially for the common mod, um, they're marking so many papers all at once. So you do want to do little things to make your stand out and not to just be like another average paper. Um, so for getting marks, I think that that's definitely a trick. But we're going to go through what all of these means. Now, the main four concepts that we just spoke about, individual and collective human experiences, which is just what any individual if I'm experiencing with someone else can experience human qualities and emotions so what are our qualities as people and what are our feelings what are our emotions anomalies paradoxes and inconsistencies those are such ugly words we're going to come back to those because that's 
probably the hardest that common mod can get when it brings up one of these words but we're just gonna we're just gonna hope that that doesn't happen in your trials or hsc and then storytelling to reflect and express particular lives and cultures um which is important that that way we can really bring in context but we're gonna go um, into each of them if you wanted to screenshot these are the most important points that I was talking about so up to you if you like um, but if you kind of weave this if you did want to try out that technique and that's personally what I did to study for English I just kind of had like a base essay on the crucible and I wasn't really proving any point it was just really my arguments my quotes my technique and like what the techniques and what my quote was about um, and then I just linked it and I kept linking it to individual and human collective experiences. I tried to link it to like challenging assumptions and bring in the words wherever I could. And then on the day of my HSC exam, it was really easy to fit it to the question because the question was kind of already what I was practicing. Because realistically, they can't take the question from anything but here. Like this is, they when they, then when they sit and they're writing these exams, they sit and they read this and we're like, okay, what are we going to take and what are we going to use? That doesn't mean that they can use it word for word, like bless if they did, but, and sometimes they can be harsh and they can use a specific like theme and we'll talk about that um, throughout the lecture. But a lot of the time and in the past few papers, they've just been using pretty general questions and it's important to remember that because there are so many options, um, it's up to them whether they give you like a specific question for your specific text or if they give a general question for um, all the text so they might just give like a question so whether you did crucible Elliot no matter what you did everybody gets the same question or they'll give this is a specific question on the crucible and this is a specific question about a specific theme in um, Elliot like for gender for example um, that really depends you don't know what they're going to do but having these wording in there either way is going to help you so let's talk about individual experiences so individual experience is a single person having a unique or relatable experience that's multiple people or persons sharing that common experience or also if you're just experiencing something in public or in society or with family that's also going to turn into a collective experience the second someone else enters the equation individual experiences is you know your main character moment where you're journaling and you're sitting by the beach and i don't know you're reflecting on life and reflecting on your values and your forgiveness and whatever collective experiences is when you're fighting with people you're conflicting with people when you're with your friends you're with your family um, and when you're kind of engaging with society so together both individual and collective have impact and they need to be examined in conjunction with another so how they kind of both balance each other out and you can understand if individually you're experiencing the human experience of forgiveness and you're going through a really like um, you're going through your healing girl stage for example and you want to forgive everyone I'm, I'm, I'm talking about it as if it's bad it's such a good thing let's just say you're going through your healing stage and um, you want to forgive people naturally that's going to affect your collective experiences when you go out into the world with others because individually you've worked on yourself and now you can spread love and kindness and care and all peace to everyone so that's the conjunction and that's just a very basic example but just to explain it how your individual experiences can then shape your collective experiences while instead if you weren't on forgiveness and you just went through a really traumatic event and you really wanted to isolate and like push people away you might be avoidant in the collective um, society and avoid people um, and detach from them and push them away and isolate yourself so that's just the connection between individual and collective experiences now human qualities and emotions let's talk about it human qualities encompass the broader characteristics that contribute to our personalities our emotions are really just our feelings so together texts explore how we respond to various situations and experiences and what our kind of inherent human nature is i feel like most of the common module texts really make a comment on humanity and they're like, well, humanity at the core is like this. And at the core, we have desires. And at the core, we judge others. And we have stereotypes, whatever it is. And it's going to apply to your text. Um, or at the core, we're sensitive. And some of us just are better at covering it and hiding it. Doesn't matter. Whatever it is, um, it's really going to be dependent on your text. Now, for the qualities and emotions, these are just different examples. So, And I wanted to show you the difference. So... Courage and ambition and imagination and maturity are all qualities. While emotions are things that you can feel. So you can feel pain, despair, shock, excitement, disgust. That's the difference between the two. Qualities are more... Like, I feel like a personality trait was like, oh, she's nice. Or, oh, she's shy. 
but a quality is more than your personality trait it's really like your values as a person and like maybe you have like the value of loyalty or you're just a really mature like you've really got that maturity um or you've really got ambition um though it it goes one step above your personality and it's kind of like oh she's like a nice quiet girl like she's a bit of an introvert like that's kind of just explaining your personality qualities is like guys we're getting deep this is deep talk qualities is like your soul qualities is like who you really are on the inside um well emotions is just how you're feeling and obviously they can differ now human behavior and emotion and motivations motivations are the forces that drive and determine human actions and motivations aren't always good it is term very important to remember that and a lot of the time when you are talking about motivations they will be in a negative light because humans are driven by the wrong or kind of like greedy um and passion consumed motivations human behaviors is how human acts how humans act on those motivations so a lot of um students get confused between human behavior and their and then human experience because they're like oh well if a human experience is anything that a human can feel or th- can feel or um go through or do then how is that difference to a behavior which a behavior is what we do but behavior is specifically linked to motivations so human behavior is how humans act on those motivations specifically those motivations rather than the individual and collective it's like let's say i have the motivation of power and the motivation of control what does that influence me to do does that influence the human behavior of corruption and of abusing power for example and that's just the connection so together the human experiences are really complex because behaviors and motivations are really hard to understand you're never going to get in another person's head and understand them um most of us are still trying to figure out themselves Uh, guys i don't know why i'm talking like this is like a therapy session at this point um but human behavior and motivation are connected to the next three so this is where anomalies paradoxes and inconsistencies come up i hate talking about this in english because it's just for the common mod like you just really gotta hope that you don't get a question on it but if you guys do you will be ready now they kind of low-key all mean the same thing anomalies are something that deve- deviates from what is standard normal or expected so for example billy elliot is an anomaly and that's why they have those specific scenes where he's the only boy against all the ballerinas in pink to make that to show that he's the anomaly and to have that message on gender paradox is a personal thing that combines contradictory features or qualities so it's really contradicting and again like like when you're comparing it like paradoxes and anomalies are pretty pretty similar but you'd rather call billy elliot and and if you've done billy elliot it makes sense you'd rather call him an anomaly than you would call him a paradox just like john proctor you'd call john proctor an anomaly rather than you'd call him a paradox a paradox is more when you're contradicting the two but he's more of an anomaly because he's standing out from what everyone else is doing if you're doing crucible um inconsistencies is something which fails to remain constant and or predictable so it's consistently changing maybe you've got like a character who like at one point is really nice but then they lose the plot and then they're going back and forth or it's an unreliable protagonist really depends on your text but low-key they kind of are all very like they all kind of really overlap so it doesn't really matter in that case what word you get all that matters is that you understand that in your text whatever text you've gotten there's got to be one character one person one theme that just stands out against the rest um and for elliot it's billy elliot and for um for crucible it's john proctor um and they are together the anomalies paradoxes and they're inconsistent with their society especially proctor um because he's kind of going back and forth and you don't really know where he stands because one second he cares about his reputation but then he's like oh no my name my name but then he still lies again and it's just like a consistent cycle so some examples um harry in past the shallows for anyone who did past the shallows um he's afraid of water and does not share a love for surfing like his brothers miles and joe do so because he, that deviates from what's expected or what's normal for like his um siblings and his family he's the anomaly now paradoxes we've also got danforth you could talk him um and you could talk about this is more where a paradox i think it's more contradictory and it's pretty ironic in the crucible he's a judge um but he's antagonized and he eventually misjudges people and a judge is supposed to be a symbol of justice and fairness um and obviously he's not enforcing that so that's a paradox because how are you going to be like use this symbol of um justice and then 
um, be the antagonist doesn't really make sense. And then the inconsistencies, you could talk about um, Jackie, how she's motivated, um, how he's motivated by care for his son, changes from rejection to acceptance towards Billy's passion for ballet. Um, you could also say that Billy was an anomaly like I was saying before, or you could say that he's inconsistent, um, but it's a bit hard to say that he's inconsistent. It's a bit, you definitely can argue and you can argue any character for any of these, but some characters are going to fit better. It's more makes more sense to talk about Jackie for an inconsistency because he starts with so much hatred and there's so much rejection towards it. But by the end, you see him when he's watching, um, Billy's ballet show in that, in that final scene. And it's such a great scene to talk about if you guys are doing Billy Elliot. I really hope that we're talking in the live chat right now um, in case because I don't want to keep going on about these two and you guys aren't even studying them. Um, but Jackie really does have that switch and that switch and that kind of change um, shows that he's inconsistent. And it's a good inconsistency because by the end he grows towards acceptance, but it does show that he wasn't always at the same point. So storytelling to reflect particular lives and cultures. Storytelling is an agent for communication which relies on language to craft meaning. It's really just telling a story. Lives, you guys know what a life is. And culture are the ideas, customs, and social behavior. So another thing to consider is audience impact because knowing that those are the rubric concepts in mind, you have to think, okay, well, what is the audience going to gain from studying the text and human experiences? And this is what I really want you guys to focus on in your study and trying to add and kind of practice working on um, because these are this is specifically what the module has identified as the audience impact so as the audience when you when you watch Billy Ellen when you read the crucible past the shallows whatever your text is you see the world differently you challenge assumptions it ignites new ideas and it catalyzes personal reflection now see the world differently and ignite new ideas very similar see the world differently is just like oh like so maybe it doesn't have to always be like that. But low-key, that's the same as challenging assumptions because we might assume, it's especially with Billy Elliot, she, um, it's really clear that ballet is for girls and the wrestling is for boys. Um, and that was a common belief of that time. Um, and it still kind of does prevail into our society now that girls shouldn't be doing and boys shouldn't really do ballet or dance. And it still has carried on, not to the same extent that it was at that time and with that context, but it still definitely lingers. Um, just kind of that stereotype and that generalization. But what texts like and what films like Billy Elliot do is they challenge that and they're like, you know what, no, we're going to put, we're going to make a film about a boy doing ballet and really succeed in it and going against what everyone expected and what everyone said. By doing that, it ignites new ideas. And the most important one, I think, is that it catalyzes personal reflection. Catalyzes personal reflection is just means that it causes us to stop and think, oh, how do I see the world? It's kind of like, oh, do I agree with this? Do I disagree with this? Has this opened my mind to possibility? Do I feel more understanding? It's like, how are you vibing with it? And all of that together is audience impact, but this is where a lot of questions come up in Common Mod, and they can just ask, like, how do the individual and shared human experience of your text challenge assumptions? Done. Ignite new ideas. Done. And it's straight from the module. So I really recommend... Just having some of these down if you are writing notes or otherwise, these are probably the most important slides of this whole document only because um, they go through such of the core ideas which they're taking questions from. So you're probably like, okay, why did you just sit here and go through all the concepts? Um, but the rubric is literally your best friend. Um, and the questions you get asked come from the rubric and the rubric only. At this point, the trials in HSC, like that, that's all it is I know um, internally. And it's also important to remember that for your internal for English, you guys would have had to use a related text and connect maybe Billy Elliot to another text um, or Crucible to another text. In your trials in HSC, you're just writing about your one text, the one book, the one film, whatever you studied, the one. It's nothing to do with the other one. Um, but it's really important that you have good knowledge of the modules because that's where they're taking all the questions from and you can just feel a bit more prepared as you study, if you kind of know what you're in for. Let's talk about making the most out of reading time. Number one, and everyone who's watching this lecture is going to do it, you're going to read the questions first before you read the text. Because if you 
we'll go through it. We're going to see some past questions as well. But the questions, a lot of the time, will tell you the human experience. And I, I told you guys about that question. I think it was the 2020 paper where they said um, the human experience of laughter. So if you read the question and you know, oh, okay, well, the poem must be about laughter, before you've even opened your source book and you've started reading about the poem, you can already start kind of planning your head. And in your head, as you're reading it, you know you're looking for laughter. You're not sitting there. You know when you sit there in short answers and you're like, I've got no clue what's going on. Like, I seriously have no idea what's going on. A lot of the time, the question will tell you. Um, and then what you can do is deconstruct each question in your head and figure out what rubric concept it might be referring to. You can also decide the order that you want to attempt the paper in um, your reading time. If you, my advice, I think sit the paper in order only because I know they give 45 minutes for short answers, but a lot of people will finish it quicker than 45 minutes um, and you won't need to use that full 45 minutes, which means you can save time. I know for me personally, um, I finished mine in 35 and then I had 55 to write my essay um, and most people can finish it in 35 to 40 minutes. They don't need that extra five minutes because it realistically is only four to five short answer questions. Um, and especially if you go in pretty prepared and you guys are going to after this lecture, um, there's just quite a few kind of like precautionary measures you can take to prepare for the short answer section that will make it even easier so hopefully um that makes sense but yeah if you don't feel confident with your common mod essay and especially if you just memorized your quotes which i'm not going to advise anyone do not learn your quotes in the morning of uh, for your trials but if you are like in the car on your way to trials and you're like forgetting your quotes already and you're really stressed out and you're like you know what i just want to do my essay first take everything's fresh in my head and go then do the essay first just make sure that you leave at least at least 35 minutes minimum but you should be leaving 40 to be safe because most students can um and then as you're reading the unseen text if you already know okay it's about laughter then you can be like okay i know what um what techniques I need to look for, I need to look for a technique that's showing laughter or I need to find some type of message about laughter. And it just makes it so much easier for yourself. So don't waste time. It doesn't make sense to read the text first, be like, oh my gosh, I don't know what's happening. Then be like, oh, let me check the question and be like, oh, it's about laughter. Let me go back and reread the whole thing and see where I can find laughter. Because a lot of students do do that and it's just not necessary. It's not necessary. So as soon as your reading time is over, you can also underline the examples you want to quote from your short answer questions if you want. It's not a must, but if you don't want to come back to it, it's really annoying going back and forth. It just depends on your timing. Now, knowing what to write, each question kind of contains the same type of like ingredients. Like you just have to identify them. When you're deconstructing it, each question kind of has some type of concept from the rubric, wherever it's saying like the human experience or something about a human emotion or a human behavior or a paradox. They've used all of this in past HSC papers. Um, it's got like a prescribed focus that um, relates to the concept and that's like for that example um, of like there's another question that's asked about the value of memory. Uh, so that's like the prescribed focus um, or it could be an audience impact statement. So how does the author challenge assumptions and it's a four marker. Now when you're deconstructing a question, um, so how has voice been employed in the text to ignite new ideas on individual experience? Um, it's very important to understand the, the concepts that they're asking you is individual and collective human experiences. Now, even though it only says individual, you still can talk about collective, but you want to make sure that your first paragraph is on individual experiences because you're not going to write about like collective human experiences first and then you haven't even mentioned anything about the question that they're asking you on until the second paragraph. So in that case, you're completely fine. But if you wanted to write an essay solely on individual experiences, they can't mark you down for it here. The prescribed focus is on voice and the audience impact is all about igniting new ideas. So really, all modules, all module words and those are all coming from um, the module. So then you can create a judgment and this is a sample one. So here we've got individual experiences are projected through the voices that have been manipulated in a text. In turn, composers are able to ignite new ideas and perspectives on the human experience for the reader. And we see the concept, we see the prescribed focus, but we also see... The audience impact so that's just an example of how you can go about and i just wanted you guys to see that the module like i keep saying like oh the module like the question is going to be the module the question is going to be the module but that's just an example just to prove me right let's keep going so 
What about this one? Evaluate how important compassion is as a human quality. So it's got compassion as the prescribed focus and it's told you it's specifically looking at compassion and you'd have to link compassion to whatever your text was. Um, for this, and let's say you were doing Billy Elliot, you could talk about compassion and you could 100% speak about um, Jackie's transition from um, rejection to acceptance. Same for um, Elliot, not Elliot, we just spoke about Billy Elliot. Same for Crucible, you could talk about Proctor's compassion or Elizabeth's compassion for giving him after he cheated on her with a minor. I'm so sorry, can we talk about the Crucible for one second? Because that story is wild. And then she like gaslights everyone and like gets so many people killed. Like I, as a HSC text, interesting, interesting. But in this case, they haven't actually given you an audience impact. So that's where you can bring up your own. Um, and what, by evaluating how important compassion is as a human quality, it makes us think, well, like, oh, what's compassion like? Are we compassionate in our world? Am I compassionate to my friends and my family? Are others compassionate to me? And you go on this whole personal reflection. Let's just pretend that, let's just pretend that, and usually I feel like personal reflection is the easiest one to kind of waffle on. The common advice you're going to get from me on here, and if anyone has ever seen literally any TikTok I've made, I'm pretty sure Nessa like wants to cancel me because I always talk about waffling, but in English, it's just, it's just a go-to. It's just a go-to and it's, I don't even think you can consider it a waffle if you're using the module language. It just like eliminates the waffle. Um, but catalyzing personal reflection is always going to be the audience impact. Like, yes, it can challenge assumptions. Yes, it can ignite new ideas. But at the end, all authors want to stop and make us think. And let's stop and think about who we are and what our values are, our beliefs. Do we still agree with them? Is this making us question them? Whatever. That's always going to come up and it's just always a go-to with writing. So here we've got compassion is represented as an essential quality when responding to human experiences through showcasing the importance of compassion. Composers are able to catalyze and generate personal reflection within their audiences. Um, and this is just an example of that where it's incorporating concept prescribed focus and audience impact. So let's talk about analyzing text under exam conditions. Um, Cause yeah, scary stuff. Um, and especially cause they're unseen. I feel like the, the actual questions that bad aren't like the questions aren't that bad. It's just the fact that it's unseen and you're under pressure and like you've literally never seen it before. Um, and all of a sudden you have to find techniques, but we're going to, we're going to go through it. Now, if it's a three, four or five marker, you literally just want one sentence answering the question. Then you want to introduce the text with a quote, and then you're just going to do quote technique analysis, link back, and then keep going. Um, now there is a technique that I want you guys to use but I have it on this page here. So it's number of quotes um, and techniques is decided by this rule. I um, mean, it's an easy way to get full marks and to just make sure that you're always writing enough. So however many marks is you minus one, and that's how many quotes you're gonna do. So if there, it's a three mark question, you can have a topic sentence and then two quotes. If it's a four mark question, you can have a topic sentence and then three quotes. If it's a five mark, you're gonna have topic sentence and four, and if it's six, then it's t topic sentence and then five. I'm sure you guys can minus one. Um, but that's just an example. Um, I don't even know why I said that as if I have any skill in math. Let's not talk about my my um, HSC score in math. But um, you just have to follow this formula and it just worked every single time. Um, it's really good at just filling the lines and the amount of lines that they give you is exactly how much they want for full marks and how much they expect so you really just want to make sure that you're filling them anyways four short answers um again they can leave out the concept and just focus on the prescribed focus or just focus on the audience impact um here they've got analyzed how the poet uses language to encourage readers to see the world differently and here you can see how even in the short answers they're using the audience impact and they're using language from the module so let's let's get to the module this is the poem life for me ain't been no crystal stare don't you set down on the steps because you find it kind of harder kind of hard for I'll see still going honey I'll still still climbing and life for me ain't been no crystal stare let me tell you from now you guys do not need these super crazy techniques 
You do not need to pull out euphemism and analogies and anaphora and words that you don't even know how to spell. I don't even know how to spell anthropomorphism. I, I really couldn't tell you. I don't, I don't care. Future English teacher, I don't care. You don't have to memorize these really great techniques. And I had friends who were going into the short answer section who were like memorizing these really full on complex techniques because they were like, no, we're not going to get good marks unless we use like the best techniques. Like it's, oh, it's trials, it's HC, they want good techniques. They know that it's unseen. There's a very different expectation in the short answer section compared to your essays. For your common mod essay, they want great language, they want great techniques because they know it's nearly been a year since you started it. So there's no excuse to have a really bad essay, really, because you've had nearly a year to work on it. For the short answer, it's the first paper, it's literally the first exam that you're sitting in the HEC, and for most of you, it'll be your first trial. They know you've never seen this text before. There isn't that same expectation, which means you can get away with it. So if you know that you can get the same mark using tone as you can using anecdotes, why would you choose the harder one? And I'm not saying don't use good techniques. Like if you find a good technique and you're like, oh, like he's a really good metaphor, use it a hundred percent, a hundred percent. But don't pressure yourself into trying to find like the smartest and the most complex technique because not only are you wasting your time because you only have 10 minute reading time anyways, but you're going to get the same mark. I seriously, I honestly wrote about an exclamation point in my trials and I still got four out of four on the question because I just didn't know how to find another technique. And I saw an exclamation point. An exclamation point is always going to emphasize their reaction or their human, um, their human emotion towards um, an event or towards a person. That's like the analysis. So don't think. So even something simple here, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. And life for me ain't been no crystal stair. Repetition. Use it. It's, it's repetitive. Anyways, here we've got a sample response. Um, so again, it starts with that... Um, with that kind of topic sentence um, and it's got um, the different techniques so we've got the extended metaphor of the crystal stair um, then it's got colloquial language which sounds like a fancy technique but colloquial language if you guys haven't heard of it before is literally like everyday kind of slang I feel like oh, this is such this is so dumb they shouldn't let me do lectures i was gonna say like slay like not that you would ever see slay in a hsc text but if you ever did colloquial language because it's just kind of like every day like <laughs> i need to stop talking anyways um we've got here repetition i said it before repetition um and yeah some of the techniques and it's got juxtaposition up here um and like the pun so you don't really need this really out there um techniques i know in the hsc last year one of the sample answers were um, using present, past, and future tense. So, like, because it was, they said, like, oh, it's written in the past tense. Like, that was the technique. And that's, like, a Nessa answer. So, you don't need to pull out these, like, crazy, crazy ones. Um, now, let's talk a bit more about the extended response. Um, because that's definitely harder to get 20 out of 20 on. I think short answers is probably the easiest section in the entire paper to get 20 out of 20 on only because if you're adding like up like a three out of three then a four out of four and you're following that like number um minus one and you're doing like enough quotes just make sure each quote has a technique and that you're analyzing and linking back and please remember again the human experience can be something really really simple um i remember in my hsc i wrote about connecting with nature because i think the story was something about a girl at the beach i had no clue what was going on and they didn't define the experience they just said reflect how the author uh, i don't know it was demonstrate how the author reflects on her experience and i'm reading it and there's some chick at the beach collecting shells i, I had no clue what was going on and i was like i don't know what i'm gonna write so then for my human experience i just kind of waffled it and i was like um the human experience of connecting with nature as the character explores the beach and then that ended up being the sample answer and that's what they used. And I, when I wrote that, I wrote out, I came out of the HSC and I was like, I can't believe like I just wrote something so dumb. But when my teachers had read the paper, they were outside and other people had really like overcomplicated it. And it was seriously, literally just about a girl who went to the beach um, and like experiencing like the nature and connecting with like the natural world around her. But other people were really taking it deep and talking about how like the beach and the shells were a metaphor for her past life and going back to her inner child. And I was just getting out of the exam and I was like, what are you possibly talking about? Like, I did not write that. And then when we spoke to our teachers, they were like, she was just at the beach. 
like it's just about nature and i was like thank god um but that's just proof that a lot of the time you can think like oh this is too basic oh there's no way just remember remember my story here with the beach that i wrote in my hsc exam but also remember that hsc questions have been on the human experience of laughter if laughing is a human experience anything is a human experience and if you waffle it out and you can just kind of make it sound smart you are all good to go so let's talk about writing introductions step by step because i feel like i don't know i feel like everyone knows but introductions are so so important only because it's the first part of your essay your marker already knows what band they want to give you they don't know if they're going to give you 17 18 16 but after your intro they will know what band they're planning on giving you so you don't want to start with like a band four and then have to prove yourself to get up to a band six rather start at a band six obviously as a last resort like obviously the goal is to stay at a band six but honestly a trick low-key is just having a really really good intro i'm not saying like write a really bad essay but if you're worried about your essay writing you can just really smash out your intro keep the bar high and then yes it'll fall but you're better off falling from a six lower than just having a general like a having like a band three for example and then falling lower for example i don't give I don't give, I don't give the right advice. Anyways, let's talk about thesis answering, um, which is what you're going to do first. And it can be one to two sentences long. Then you want to introduce the text in relation to the module. And this can include your themes and your arguments. And this is more the stuff that you can memorize and prepare. And then we're going to talk about an audience impact linking um, section. So let's look at this one. Discuss how Billy, Billy Elliot explores complexity of human relationships. So for this one, you would want to connect complexity of human relationships through the themes of and say what they are. Um, the concept itself comes from anomalies, paradoxes and inconsistencies because complexity only comes in with those three. Like if something's complex, it's because either he's standing out and there's a deviation, something's contradicting or something's changing. So this is a band six sample. So we've got individual motivations and behaviors, which are innately complex can greatly impact how relationships develop and change through representing these anomalies, paradoxes, and inconsistencies. Composers can challenge preconceived assumptions we may hold on others in our immediate world. This notion is explored in Stephen Dowdry's film, Billy Elliot, whereby the titular protagonist and his relationships with other characters are explored through the ideas of responsibility, agency, and passion. Examining the film's character motivations and behaviors can in turn encourage us to similarly navigate the intricacies of our own desires and build meaningful relationships. Chef's kiss. Chef's kiss because the first the first two lines really answer the question and get straight into it and look at the complexity of it so well and then are making that link to the module. The second line is really introductory, but it is bringing in your themes. And for this one, it's responsibility, agency, and passion. And the last one is really linking to audience impact. It's just chef kiss if you are doing Billy Elliot screenshot. Um, but using relevant terminology, and if you're looking at this and you're like, I don't know how to write like that, these are the main things it's doing. It's using relevant terminology from the question and from the rubric. And that's why I really promise you that if you have, let's say you write a practice introduction, have the rubric open right next to you and edit it and use those words in yours and add them in because when i'm looking at this now anomalies inconsistencies um and paradoxes that's all from the rubric and then this entire the composers can challenge preconceived assumptions entirely from the rubric entirely and it adds just adds so much to it um and then introducing the text in relation to the module rather than retelling the content like you don't have to be like Billy Elliot is a story about a boy who chooses um, to pursue his dance dreams despite blah, blah. Like they know that they know that you don't have to do that. I feel like it's very easy to fall into that. But if you do, if you do end up doing that, you fall into retelling and you can lose marks really easy. Um, and you also have to consider audience impact and what an audience would learn from studying it. And just remember that you are also the audience. So for writing bodies, um, you, you want kind of all your analysis um, to flow in together. Now, with quotes, I don't like talking about it because every school is going to do different things. It's honestly up to you how many quotes you want to do per paragraph. I, I seriously know schools where sometimes they only want two quotes per paragraph, and that's completely fine. Um, do what your school is telling you to do. 
and then if your trial mark isn't reflecting what you want it to then I think adding more quotes would be better if you are um, not writing as many but I'm not going to sit here and tell anybody any specific range because honestly you can get away with four to five really good quotes really good quotes definitely getting six to eight um, is going to help your analysis more um, but three to five examples under exam conditions is acceptable is acceptable as long as you're analyzing them with the techniques and they're analyzed in equal detail that's the most important and then you always want your argument summary and audience impact linking sentences so this is on um, William Street. So if any of you guys are studying Slessa, this is what I mean when I said like I'm not specifically going through any text, but I still wanted to make sure that we could look at some of the other ones um, in case you are doing it. So if you are doing Slessa, this is your time to shine. You can take a screenshot. The question is, empathy grants us the ability to understand challenging human experiences. To what extent do you agree? Guys, if you get it to, if you get a, if you get a to what extent question, you have to say the extent. You have to say the extent. And I'm saying that out there now because this exemplar does not have the extent. It is a very beautiful exemplar. Um, and I was going to, I left it out on purpose because I wanted to see if anyone commented it. But then I was like, I don't want to play games um, with anyone. Um, but this is just proof that even a great, great paragraph, technically it's not really answering the question um because it's not saying what the extent is and some some markers will be very picky on this and it's literally just one word to add in but just adding that one word you're just safe we just we don't want to play games now now's not the time internals internals we could have done that but trials and agency we have to crack down and make sure we're doing the right things so again for this band's example for anyone that read it it really directly addresses the question and it is using appropriate rubric language um and references where possible which again it's going to come up in every single one um the techniques are analyzed and evaluated in how they represent human experience and then it's got an audience impact sentence um at the end where he convinces us to reimagine the setting and really spe specifies that now writing conclusions please write conclusions please finish um obviously everyone's goal is to but a lot of people don't finish um their english trials a lot of people will finish in hsc because they'll be traumatized from trials and not finishing but hsc markers especially if you don't have a conclusion they use that as an excuse to automatically take off one mark even if you wrote a 20 out of 20 essay only because without a conclusion they're like okay well where's the structure mark how can i give you a mark on structure when you don't have intro body par paragraph conclusion like that's the base structure and you don't want to fall into that and lose a mark like that. Like lose a mark for something genuine, but for missing out on like three to four lines, four to five, maybe six max is like, it's just not worth it. Um, the only way to make sure that you can finish it is by practicing past papers and timing. But we're going to talk about that a bit later. Um, but for your conclusion, you're going to reinforce your judgment to summarize the key themes. And then again, audience linking sentence. So if you were to write a conclusion, for step by step um how the text is encouraging you to reconsider what it means to have humanity and guys i put all these questions on here as well so if you do need extra practice questions you can always download the slides and come back and write practice ones um but this is um this is the conclusion for um i am alala um and it's got yeah, it's reiterating the initial thesis. Now, I feel like a lot of the time the conclusion is literally just your introduction restated. Um, it is reiterating it, but you're more summarizing it um, while in the intro you're introducing it. While in the summary um, and in the conclusion, you can really reinforce it one final time and show like the lasting influence and how everything connects. And it just makes a lot more sense by the end of it. So in terms of preparing for paper one, um, construct your notes for your prescribed text. Now it's up to you. Um, it's up to you. Sorry, I didn't even realize what, what GIF I put. Um, what, it's up to you what you want to do in terms of memorizing. Personally, for me, I never memorized a full essay. I just couldn't. Um, I really respect people that can. Like people that can memorize like word for word, like a thousand essay, like pretty mad. I couldn't, like my memory was not that good, but I did memorize my quotes, techniques and my analysis because realistically you're, you're going in with the same quotes anyways. 
you go in with the same maybe five amount of quotes, six amount of quotes. Why would you not memorize the technique as well? Because the technique is also going to be attached to that quote. And if you're going to memorize the technique, that quote always has the same meaning. That quote will always be from the same character who's trying to express this point or show their emotion of this. It's always going to have the same meaning. You're just going to prove it to a different point. So that's why I think it's just so worthwhile quote technique and analysis memorizing that. Full analysis, I wouldn't memorize my full analysis. I'd maybe memorize like two dot points and I kind of just do them on a flashcard. Um, because if you do that and you leave some space, then you don't have a choice but to go back and um, what's it called? To go back and link it back to the question. But I would also memorize just my topic sentences and I'd switch them up. So if I memorize my topic sentence, I'd never write a word for word on my exam, but I'd use it as kind of like a base and then link it to the question. Because your topic sentence, again, your themes are always going to be the same. You're, I'm sure not, like some people do this, very rarely I've met people who do this where they'll like learn like six themes and like multiple quotes for each and they'll choose whichever one best suits the question. Personally, not me. I picked my two to three and I was out. Whatever I picked, I was writing on that paper. Um, but your message about that theme is never going to change. It's always going to be the same message. Um, it's the same meaning. It's just you're going to prove it to a different point and maybe your one, one, maybe in your trials you're going to prove that it's an inconsistency but then in your HSC, you're just proving that it's a complex and challenging experience. Like, it really just depends on the model question. Um, but stuff like that and also introduction statements, like that really good one that we saw before that was just really general um, and kind of like introduced the text. Stuff like that you can also memorize because, especially if you're using the module language, um, it just really fits well in. That's my advice. You don't have to do it. I don't want to sit here and be like, everybody memorize. I don't also want to sit here and be like, nobody memorize. A lot of people are memorizing and it definitely works, but if you are planning on do it, doing it, just make sure that you practice adapting it first and that you don't want the first time you write the essay out like fully to be the day of the exam. Um, you want to do practice to different questions and even if you don't sit the full paper and you just set like a 45 minute timer and you just write like your common mod essay, it's still good practice. Um, and you can just get that practice adapting. A lot of people are like, oh no, but my essay was so good. Why didn't I get full marks? I memorized it. But if you just go in and write like a memorized word for word copy, it has no words from the actual question. They'll know it's memorized and then you're not going to get a band six. Even if it's at a 20 out of 20 level, they're not going to give you the marks because they'll know that it's memorized. So we're trying to like gaslight them into thinking that it's not memorized, even though the low key parts kind of are, um, if that's something that you're considering doing. Um, you can get your practice questions peer marked or marked by your teachers if they're still accepting it. Um, but I really also recommend having like quotes and techniques and kind of making like a table. I'm planning to actually post one so you guys don't have to make it yourself probably in the next week. So again, not to plug the eight hundred account, but if you wanted to follow, I'm trying to get out a lot of content before trials and HSC. Um, but I'm thinking of just making like a table that has like the main techniques, the easiest ones to spot and they're like really easy analysis that's going to work every time. Um, and you can always write your own practice questions if you're writing out because there only is four practice questions that you can do because they changed the syllabus in um, 2019. So there's only 2019, 2020, 21 and 22 that you can see. All right, now we're going to go to paper two. I feel like paper one, like, it's not that bad. Hopefully you see that it's not that bad. I'm not sitting here and saying it's fun, but it's a lot less bad than this. So paper two, section one is on language identity and culture. You've got 20 marks and you only have 40 minutes. Well, they recommend 40 minutes because it's much more crunched. While for your common law essay, it's recommended 45. Um, section two is in the close study of literature. And then section three, everybody's favorite surely is the craft of writing. I say that so sarcastically but if it is your favorite I mean no offense I actually respect people who like mod C and are good at it so much because you just have to you just have to be built different it just has to be a skill to be good at this module it's such a flex in my opinion not one that I can participate in but we'll get around to it let's talk about um mod A so mod A language identity and culture and again the syllabus just gives you so much so language is a system of communication. You guys know, I'm sure you did this in class. 
An identity is just how we expri- express ourselves and our individuality. And culture is a way of life of a particular group of people at a certain time and place and how um, they're living out their beliefs and values. Perspectives is literally how we see the world. Perceptions is the views which are gained by the responser, by the responder. And self-perception is how we view and understand ourselves. Those are just some of the key words. So module A only has a single audience impact, um, but like the common mod and mod B, you can always express it in your own ways. But the audience impact that they have in mod A in the actual syllabus is a firm, ignore, reveal, or cha- challenge, or disrupt prevailing assumptions and beliefs. So it can just completely ignore them and pretend that those assumptions don't exist. It can reveal them and be like, hey, did you realize that this is how we're looking at this group of people or these um, individuals? It can affirm them and say, you know what, those assumptions that you will have is actually correct. But a lot of the time it's challenging or disrupting them. And it, it depends what text you're doing. A lot of the times it is challenging or disrupting them. And I wouldn't be surprised if you guys have seen this wording before because this is very common wording for questions and it's the only audience impact that's going to come up. So when it comes to writing um, a module A essay, keeping the six concepts that we just reviewed in mind is really good because you want to integrate these words throughout, especially perspectives and that audience impact. So um, we've got this question, without language there would be no culture and this this is what they always do in mod A. A lot of the time they're connecting the two. Like if it's not going to be language and culture, it's going to be language and identity or it's going to be culture and identity. Like they really like to connect the two because again, it's a module in all three. Um, and this one's evaluate the truth of these statements. So you're going to say that it's true to a great extent. You're going to say it's of significant truth. You do it because it's an evaluate. You have to make that judgment. Um, this is a band six response on, um, Lawson's short story. So again, if you're doing Lawson, sorry, not again, this is the first time I was talking about Lawson, but if you are doing Lawson for mod A, you are all good to take a screenshot here. Um, if you guys want to have a quick read through, the most important thing is that it's using the terminology from both the question, but also the rubric. Um, and it's really transforming the audience impact into more of a personal argument. Um, So if you read the last line, as a result, we are are able to better understand the invariable connection between language and culture, as well as how language can maintain our own perceptions on what it means to be Australian today. It's really gone above and beyond where it's definitely taken what the syllabus has said, um, but then adding in that like personal perception of like what it means to be Australian today, just that kind of unique take on it. Now, in terms of strengthening your analysis, you want to make sure that your concepts and your evidence and like your quotes are supporting the themes in your body paragraph and they're gearing you towards analysis of the module now key themes in mod a are assimilation class discrimination empowerment prejudice stereotype status marginalization now for some of you these might not apply but most of the common themes are here now when you're approaching the mod a essay um there's so many different types of questions they can give you so let's talk about how to fit them So we've got this question, which is poetry relies primarily on symbolism to create cultural tension. To what extent? So if you were to get this, you'd have to say the symbolism of what? Like you can't just say it is true to a great extent that poetry relies primarily on symbolism to create cultural tension about heritage. Like, okay. Okay, just tell me the question again. And I don't even say that in a mean way because I used to do it all the time. And I thought like, oh, I'll just like reword the question in my own words. Babe, you were literally just rewriting the question. Um, and especially for your first line when they're judging you so hard in that introduction and like maybe like you're like you don't know where you are, but like what if you're after like a really bad paper? No. <laughs> but what if you are after like someone um like like a like a, a lower paper and then you just have this opportunity, it's this great opportunity for you to stand out and then all you did was start your essay repeating the question. We're not going to risk it. We are not going to risk it. Um, so this is on um, Translucent Jade um, for anyone that's studying um, the poem collection for Mod A. Um, it's got language offers a space for individuals to explore heritage, resolving cultural pressures and tensions with the past. Tan illuminates the ongoing process she's undertaking to accept her cultural background as part of her identity. And you can see already, like, it's got the culture, it's got the identity, it's got the cultural pressures and tension. Um, and by the end, it's bringing up identity again. So it's just it's just a win, in my opinion. 
Anyways, in terms of constructing your notes, it's really up to you. I don't like talking about like how to do notes and how to study for English because everyone is very different. I feel like on content subjects and for math and the sciences, like studies kind of, it's kind of all the same. Like everyone kind of does the very similar things. But for English, it's so different. Like some people are memorizing essays word for word. Others are memorizing parts of it. Some aren't memorizing at all and they're just constructing notes that they're reading. Um, and then, yeah, it's really up to you. Um, but if you did want to try this method, which is what a lot of online notes use, I find they've got like the theme and then they've got like all the quotes for that theme or the analysis and then, sorry about that. And then all the audience impact. And that just makes sure that you're consistently linking back to the module. So that's always an opportunity if you guys wanted to do that. Um, but notes are only useful if you combine them with practice responses. Like you can have so many notes 27 pages of notes just on mod a if you do not sit a practice mod a question and you practice writing out that essay and adapting to the question there's just no point notes should always be a starter i feel like in a lot of subjects it's like oh like my notes my notes my notes notes should be your starter but your end point should be practice papers and i hate to say it because i really did not like sitting past papers especially for english you know how annoying it is to sit for like two hours and write two essays and a creative i'm not sure how many of you guys have done any sets of trials yet or if you guys have tried a past paper yet but like for some of the other subjects they're like three hour papers like you're just gonna sit there by yourself like i would sit to try and do an english one but after i finished one essay i was like i deserve a snack i deserve to go on my phone and i'd pause my timer and i just wouldn't even get back to it um and i feel like procrastination is so normal um so with past papers, my advice for it is I don't think you should start doing past papers until you have memorized your quotes and you feel pretty good. Like look at a couple past questions and be like, oh, I feel like I could answer this. I feel like I could answer that. Um, and once you're ready, definitely try it out. But I don't recommend if it's your first time ever doing like a practice response under time conditions at home by yourself. I don't recommend just putting on a two hour time and being like, okay, I'm going to do mod A, mod B and mod C all in one. Um, that's obviously the end goal and I definitely for all of you guys think that if you as long as it, as long as you do the paper at least once at least once you just know for a fact that you can finish and you have that security going in so you don't have to think oh like what if I don't finish what if I don't finish because in your head you know that you've finished it before and that you're going with the same quotes the same techniques the same analysis and the same arguments so that's one of my um, tips there is that if you know that you might struggle like sitting like a two hour past paper like first time which is very valid just put on a 40 minute timer and only write your mod a essay and just make sure you can write it in 35 to 38 minutes and then you're good you are all good all right let's get to mod b i'm gonna have a quick drink of water because i don't think i've ever spoken more in my entire life But let's talk about mod b hopefully we're talking in the live chat if you guys have any questions a little bit awkward if i keep mentioning it and like no one's left but i'm gonna be there so if you have any questions please let me know now mod b i don't know i'm not sure how you guys feel about it personally for me if i had to rank the modules i'm gonna put common mod yeah i'm gonna put common mod on top um, I really don't like the inconsistencies and the paradoxes. That's probably still one of the things that annoys me because I just feel like it's just such a nice module with the collective experiences and it only like that's where they like bring it into confusion and it makes sense. But like you just who wants to write about that realistically while writing about the personal and shared human experiences um, is definitely um, just more chill. Like I never want to write an English essay, but I don't mind it and I don't hate it when it's on like a really simple question on personal and human experiences but for um i'd put module b second only because mod a oh it depends on what text you're doing honestly mod a only annoys me because i feel like it really focuses on language culture and identity like i get that that's the module title but sometimes it can be hard to connect them um, and sometimes like maybe language and identity go better together than language and culture, but then they end up asking on language and culture. And I just feel like culture and language also really overlap. And that's the point is that they all overlap, but it just makes it a little bit confusing at times. Anyways, this is the close study of literature. Um, it's just really this mod B and your mod B is just very kind of stock standard as in like any essay question that you've ever gotten from year seven. 
where they can ask you about the meaning, the context, the language features, the personal interpretation and the meaning and significance of the text. We're going to look at some of the, the most important things. So it wants an informed understanding, knowledge and appreciation. So by informed, you want to show some knowledge, guys. Could you guess that? For understanding, sorry, there is like a spot in my eye and I really can't see. So I'm kind of like blind in one eye. I don't know what's going on there. Um, understanding and knowledge is to comprehend and have an awareness of um, a text ideas. And appreciation is recognition or enjoyment of the valuable qualities from the text and really appreciating me like you know what this is this is a great text this is a great text you guys i actually have no clue what's going on oh my gosh i pressed the wrong button i don't know what's going on or if it's there's like a lamp in my eye so i don't know i apologize for this for this physical issue i don't know what's going on with my eye i don't want to keep distracting you guys um personal responses to the text in its entirety so personal response is demonstrating your own engagement and interest in the text now when it says personal response i used to get confused because i was like do they want me to write like oh this is how i felt about it this i was really interested in it no you will never you will never except for your reflection in creative writing you are never going to use the word i in an essay it's always going to be third person and really like formal um but when it says personal response it's really just like your kind of take on it and what it taught you but without saying it so you can say which teaches us or which teaches readers to and you can consider yourself the reader and say well like maybe if you read the poems um like translucent jade it makes you reflect on if you've lost touch with your culture and then you catalyze your own personal reflection on your childhood um and your memories with um family for example, just an example. Now, distinctive qualities are the characteristics um, that serve and portrayal is just how um, different ideas and people um, affect one another in the text. Now, for audience impact, it is the unity of a text, its coherent use of form and language to produce an integrated whole in terms of meaning and value. So it's all about meaning and value. But guys, what's really annoying about Mod B and which is why I probably would I don't even know if I'd put mod A or B on top. I feel like in the, because of this, I'd kind of low-key put mod A on top. But mod B only gets frustrating because there's a lot of focus on form, which is um, the genre of your text, but also the structure of it, um, and then language. So if you are doing Curious Incident um, of the Dog in the Nighttime, form is really good to talk about because they've got like the visual representation you can talk about the chapters in prime numbers like there's really good examples of form um and it does apply for other texts as well but there is a higher expectation for form and language in module b now there's also a thing called textual integrity which they talk about and textual integrity just means that it still has value so maybe your text was made in the 1900s why are we studying it in 2023 why would they put it on there because in Nessa's eyes, it still has values. So by having value, all it means is that it's still relevant. It's kind of timelessness and it's kind of universal. It's transcending time. It's got a lasting impact. It's got a continual significance. And textual integrity is all about like how, what's the integrity of the text? Like does it stay? Has it remained? Is it still important? And when you look at texts like Pride and Prejudice, Little Women, um, and some of the classics, how are they still so popular today? after so 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 many years how are they still same with like romeo and juliet and some of shakespeare's classics like how are they still so popular today hundreds of years later because they've got enduring value because they're timeless and they're transcending time by using such universal themes so that's something you can add in um you have studied your text closely um it's up to, i'm not actually sure how much of module b you guys would have finished because i know for some of my tutoring students they still have just started it um but this is how you can challenge questions so let's look at this one relationships occupy our understanding of robert gray's poetry to what extent do you agree with it um this is an example where you don't necessarily always have to agree with the question so what this what this sample paragraph is doing it's saying that yes um relationships and poetry is important but the relationship between the individual and the environment shows more about the provided distinctive qualities 
So you don't necessarily always have to agree with the question. Like if you look at it and you're like, you just kind of feel like, no, like that's not going to match my essay. Don't answer. You don't. There's not like they, they give you the, the question in that case um, with purpose. And so that you can have that choice to disagree if you wanted to, if you wanted to. Um, but yeah, for getting a band six in it, again, it's, it's really all the same thing. So I'm showing you all these different examples, but the actual things to do are all the same. It's just responding to the questions using the keywords, um, providing relevant themes and suggesting audience impact. Incorporating textual integrity, no matter what, like, I don't care what question you guys get, guys, I, what question you guys get, guys, I don't care what question you get. If you're watching this lecture, please just write about sexual integrity, even just once, even just once, add it into your intro, intro, sprinkle it in. It's one of those little things that you can do to really stand out. Um, but it just shows that your text is unique and that it has timelessness. It's just going to make your markers happy. We want to make them happy. We want to get brownie points. So we're going to do it. Now, in terms of how to incorporate it, this is the difference between the two. So you want it to round off your analysis and then link it back to the module. So you can say, therefore, studying wholly through the lens of Nash documentary cautions us how media can be manipulated to serve an agenda. Or you can say, therefore, studying wholly through the lens of Nash documentary um, reminds us that media has an ongoing influence over how we understand the world and urges us today to be mindful and critical of its manipulation to serve certain agendas. Chef's kiss. But they're both saying the same thing. The second one just has more of that personal opinion and influencing us on how we understand today and urges us and it's much more about the the effect of us today so what's important to remember with mod b a lot of people when they're talking about mod b and they're writing their mod b essays you do bring up context occasionally and sometimes it can come up and i definitely recommend writing about it here and there in your mod b essay but the context and like maybe like the reason why your author wrote it for that audience, there's a contextual audience, which is the audience they wrote it for at the time. And then there's a contemporary audience, which is us. So it is really important to remember and to just try and get some better marks in mod B. You're not only talking about, well, how did the text go at that time? And did they like it? And was there a bad reaction? And what was going on in that world? It's also, well, how is it still timeless today? Um, so this is a paragraph from... Curious incident um, of the dog in the night time. Um, but it's actually got the quote. Um, so quotes in here. So if you are doing it, you are all good to, <laughs> to take a screenshot and use this. But again, it's answering the question, integrating the key words. So it's got Haddon's novel illustrates that the ideal of a novel family is an unattainable goal, harnessing the unconventional style of the novel to highlight the strong connections that arise from the abnormal family. And that really fits with the um the how like the distinct language is working um and then using such distinct language and such different language fits such a different plot um and the message of it 100 percent. and that last sentence i feel like all these last sentences are chef's kiss um like how it explores deep interpersonal connections that extend towards having a lasting meaningful impact on readers today kiss that last slide you can use for any text i don't care what text you're doing you guys can all use it now, in terms of constructing notes for mod B, again, if you wanted to try this technique, this is what a lot of people online are doing with their notes. Personally, I just had my like mod B quotes, my technique and analysis on flashcards. And then I also memorized just some general statements um, and just some really good lines. Like I would honestly memorize something like this, like explores deep personal connections that extend towards having a lasting meaningful impact. Like, I would actually memorize something like that only because you can use that no matter what. Like, that's always going to come up. And that's what I mean. The context of the text and the meaning of it is never going to change. Um, it's only what you're linking it to. So, we're going to go to mod C. But we're just going to low-key have a two-minute break because there is so much in here. And I feel so bad, like, dumping all of this on you. So, if anybody does have any questions go to the live chat i'm just going to quickly drink some water before we jump into mod c because i really want to look into mod c and i kept it last but i tried to get through the others only because mod c yeah like i said not many people like it i'm definitely not a fan but i really did improve um from my internal to my trials and felt a lot more confident with it for hsc and i want to help you guys feel like that as well 
So we will get started on that. Sorry, you guys, please don't look in the corner. What should we try? <laughs> Anyways, let's get started. We'll just start with some light work because it's going to get a bit much as we talk about discursives and get really into it. Craft of writing, guys, it's a wild card. Now, for, um, for the other modules, you know you're going to get a 20 mark essay. You know you're going to get a 20 mark essay. Same for the short answers. You know you're going to get six mark here, three mark there. But mainly for the essays, you know that you are 100% going to get the 20 mark essay. You know you're going to get an essay. You don't know what the question is going to be, but you know you're going to get marked with a 20 mark essay. We can't say the same thing for Mod C. And what I do want to do is quickly bring up some class questions just to show you what they can do. What they can do is they can give you 12 mark creative discursive with an 8 mark reflection. So it's one year. They can give you 10 mark creative, 10 mark reflection. Again, this is another 12, 8. And I think that was the last out of our questions. But there also is the case that they give you a straight 20, 20 marker, 20 mark create, creative or discursive. So why they do that they do it on purpose because the module before it was called discovery and a lot of people were memorizing their creative pieces so they were like you know what we're gonna come up with the craft of writing which is all about crafting um and is really trying to stray away from memorizing and it's not that you can't memorize a story i memorized the story um i kind of had one piece but what i did to get around this wild card and it worked so well is that i had like my base piece and i think my base piece was like 750 words which is how much you'd need for like a 15 marker. And then I had the same piece, but a 500 word version. So I literally just copied and pasted it and got rid of one of the sections, like one of the like extra facts that I put in to kind of like develop her characterization. Because if I got a 10 marker, I'm not going to write 750 words. If I get a 10 marker, I can get away with only writing 500 words. So why would I rush my timing and like risk not finishing when I can just get the same, I, mean, I can get like exactly the same mark um, writing less so I had a 10 mark version of my story I ended up also making a 12 mark a 15 mark and then I had from that base story that was 750 I also had a 1000 word one just in case because one of the HSC papers in advance had once asked um, to write a 20 mark creative and not do any reflection that's just an example um, but that's what I did to get around it now obviously you don't have to do that for me it wasn't that bad like I tell people that and they're like oh that's just so much memorizing but it was still the same story. It was still the same character. I just know for the 1,000 word one, I added an extra flashback. And for my 500 word one, I took out a section. Like, but it's still the same story. Like, you're just adding and minusing when you need to. So that worked for me personally. I know my students all prefer different things. Some of them prefer to go in with, like, two stories. And when we do that, and if you are planning on doing that, my advice and what I always get my students to do is we'll have one story that's kind of light kind of maybe ambiguous just a bit different and then realistically <laughs> we're going to talk a bit about trauma dumping because it happens and it's not as bad as the thing is made out to be but you don't want to actually trauma dump. we're going to talk about it but for um the mod c a lot of us write really sad stories and my first story was so sad it was about like isolation and depression and i was like why were you writing something so sad and then my trial story when I ended up writing something new was actually a really nice like light story it was kind of like bittersweet but it was like it still had it was bitter but it still had the sweet ending so um what I do for my students is I get them to have a piece that's kind of bittersweet or nice ending and then a sad one that way that you can make sure naturally that the texts are pretty different because it's got a completely different atmosphere and that's going to change the language entirely but it also changes what kind of themes and human experiences you're looking at um which i think is really important and they'll go in with the two and then depending on the stimulus they'll adapt but we're going to go through them so there's also the broad study of multiple texts that you guys do in variety of forms so that's your prescribed text these are some of them um guys the act actually the only ones that i have studied that i know of are the fringe benefits of failure and um the pedestrian 
looking at the others. Yeah, those are the two that I know. So if you do have any specific questions on those for the live chat, please let me know. I'm more than happy to add. Anyways, for audience impact, it's to describe the world around them. That's why you're writing a creative piece to describe the world around you. It's to evoke emotion. It's to share a perspective, but it's also to share a vision. Um, and you really have to get into that cap where it's like I'm, I'm a craft. I'm a crafter of writing, and um, really just try to write as figuratively as you can and make it sound. If you are planning to do a creative, um, and of course if you're planning to discursive, we'll talk about that one as well. Now, like I said, they can play with mark allocations and tricky questions enforce other restrictions related to your prescribed text to see how you respond creatively. So let's look at these ones. Now, this one, 12 marker, and it has to end with the provided image. I wanted to show you guys this one because this is from the 2019 HSA, and a lot of people thought that you had to take this literally. Like your character physically had to end up in an alleyway with graffiti. That's not true though. Um, and a it's not a mistake because it's not bad if you do this and it's completely fine if your character does end up with it. But HSE markers have said and what they say for the band six students is that band six students across standard and advanced are taking metaphorical approaches at it. So instead of just looking at this picture and thinking, oh, it's just like some street art, you can talk about the path and how it's narrow but it feels long. And there's obviously a journey to get there but has your character taken the first step or are they just frozen? And it's kind of like the metaphor of journeys and taking that step and discovery and self-growth. You could also talk about the unknown and you don't really know what's next and what's at the end. Like you can't really see. Um, but is your character ready to go find out or do they want to stay in their comfort zone? I know it sounds like waffling. That's because it is waffling. But all those metaphors give you more opportunity to talk about your text so instead of thinking like oh my gosh i've got this really sweet story and now my character just has to randomly end up in some like street art alleyway no your text can still end about having to make a decision having to honestly pick between two sides as well see how there's the line down the middle and then there's two opposing sides and it's like well where do you stand it can definitely be something on conflict it can be about appearance and reality it can be something about art if you wanted to make it metaphorical um it's up to you and i'm not saying you can't talk about street art and maybe you end up adding like street art to your text that's completely fine but um it's just not the only thing that you can do and you can take it metaphorically and if you do take it metaphorically not only do you open more opportunities to talk about and like link your story more but you also um it's kind of like brownie points for your markup so wear a fan they love setting the most random setting. So use the above image to write creatively about a character's response to entering this unfamiliar setting for the first time. For this one, this is good because all that you really have to change is just kind of adding a paragraph on the setting. Your entire story can take place here, but it's just about this setting. And what about this setting makes your character think or like kind of um, gives you the exact one. Um but yeah that's all you can really do again this is actually from a Nessa sample paper this isn't from any past paper they have never done anything like this it is a bit strange but I wanted to show you guys just in case because if Nessa's put it in their sample papers literally anything's possible but if you did get this you could still use the same character still use the same story but you'd probably have to cut out a paragraph from it and chop it out with the characters responding to entering the unfamiliar setting and maybe they're sitting down and they bring someone with them or they're on the phone or whatever your story is and then as you're as they're doing that you can just add a couple extra lines throughout the piece about the unfamiliar setting and how it's so outside the comfort zone etc here we've got a 12 mark and an 8 marker so we've got this one i must go down to the seas again to the lonely sea and the sky a lie get all you can do a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to get its pants on which both of them um, very imaginative lines and it's very much how you take them and maybe your story is about a lie and you've got some type of deceit or betrayal if you get that then that's perfect um, or maybe you've actually got something about the water or the ocean or maybe you're just talking about um, loneliness or nature and this is going to fit perfectly either one um, it's just an example of how you can adapt it to the stimulus here we've got um, and this is what I mean when they can do 
this is cruel. So this was composed a piece of imaginative writing that is set in a significant place. So it has to have a specific setting. This from the 2020 paper. And again, 20 marks straight creative. No reflection. They don't even give you the option to write a discursive. It's just a creative. So if you are planning on doing a discursive, I do recommend just at least have a creative idea in the back of your head just, just in case. Um, because you don't know what they can give you and you don't want to end up like this. And if you are going with creative, everyone's like, oh my gosh, what if they ask for a 20 mark discursive? They haven't done it yet. I can't say it's 0% chance, but it is pretty unlikely. A lot of schools actually dodge discursives because they don't want to teach their students and confuse them. Um, but yeah, in this case, you'd need a 1000 word story, which is why I think that that technique that I was using where I had the same story, but it was just a longer version. And I literally just added like a flashback and low key some extra traumas for her <laughs> that could make it a bit longer. And it works for me. But for this one, um, the stimulus is this is my world. Now it can be yours too. If you like a place can soak through your skin, like sweat and ooze in your heart and soul, breathe it in and let me tell you a story. Now you can actually talk about a story time. And like it can actually be like maybe like a parent telling their child their story. It doesn't tell you who it's talking to. Or you can tell, you can do and you can make a whole kind of metaphor out of this story. Um, it's a place can soak through your skin. Um, and really that focus on place is why setting is so, so important in common mod. Now, sometimes you're, in, you're asked to incorporate the stimulus in the response and you can achieve this in many ways. So you can either straight away, like as soon as the text starts, bring up the stimulus um, and make it very direct. Um, and that also makes sure that you don't forget it, about it completely. You can do it in the middle and you can kind of draft a block, which maybe like you have um, the stimulus and then you fit it in the rest. Or you can do it at the end. I feel like I always did it at the end, but looking back and just looking at how a lot of students perform, you're much better off doing it in the opening in the middle because you don't want to like link to it too late and the whole time your mark is like, oh, where's the stimulus? And they're like, oh, it's there. You don't want that to happen. It's just not worth it. Um, and it's just, a, it's just a bit risky. So I feel like it's definitely not bad and I didn't and I, I still um, was really happy with my mod C marks doing that. But I think that um, for stimulus incorporating, it, especially word for word, don't ever put like the whole paragraph. Like let's say you wanted to put in this stimulus. You could start it with this is my word now comma and add in your quote. Then I'm not until the next paragraph you say breathe it in. I need to tell you or like let me tell you a story. And just kind of splitting it up so it's not like okay let me just dump all of this here. Um, there's this one. I found something extraordinary in the ordinary. Um, use this statement as an ending line for a creative. So it actually ends on that and it's a 20 mark creative. Um. So that's where sometimes you will have to subvert your story. Maybe if it's a bad ending, it has to be a happy ending, which is why I'm like, always just have different versions of your story. I had a version of my story that had a happy ending. I had a version with a sad ending. I had a version where um, you really love the protagonist and I had one where you absolutely despise her and you like don't understand and she's like an unlikable protagonist. And I just had different versions of the same piece just so in case it wasn't going to fit the stimulus I had, even though I was going in with, because a lot of people are like, oh, as if you only went in with one piece, but that one piece was so adaptable and I had practice adapting it. I had it planned out just in case. Now, um, this is, um, part of just kind of an exemplar that you can read for language. Um, the response actually ends with the stimulus. So I did not know it then, but I know now I realize that I truly found something extraordinary in the ordinary. Um, and yeah, that's just a way that you can bring it in. Um, but it skillfully integrates not only the craft of writing, but also just the figurative language. I think if you're struggling with writing creatively and if you keep getting advice, that's like, oh, you're doing too much, um, telling instead of showing. My best advice is to stop and go to Pinterest. Honestly, Pinterest was my best friend during year 12. And whenever I would write anything, and still to this day, because I have to do creative writing units for uni, because for some reason I decided to become an English teacher. <laughs> um, sorry, that sounds bad. I'm very happy with my course. I'm just not happy that I have to relearn Mod C. I was like, I thought we left this in year 12. Anyways, um, even in uni to this day, I still use um, Pinterest for inspiration. So if you're writing a story on disconnection for example go into pinterest search disconnection poems and i promise you you will find some of the most beautiful poems so well written and they'll just make you you just feel inspired and you can kind of set the standard of course like these are very popular poets and you're not going to expect it to 
go um, exactly to that quality um, and that level of value. But it's really just good um, to just have that inspiration and just to kind of expose yourself. I know everyone's like, oh, just like read more. Trials is in three weeks. I don't have time to pick up 10 books and all of a sudden start reading like and really like fix up my creative flair like definitely in the long term and working towards HSC if you want to start reading more it will help your writing but food in figurative language um you can really get help from it by exposing yourself just to poems I think because they're really quick on the metaphors um you can also use a stimulus as a central idea um and that's sometimes they can ask you about it but you can just kind of brainstorm some words that associate with the stimulus and integrate it so you're making um, connections to it and I think the most important thing is that if you think of the stimulus as kind of like the outline of the puzzle and the bigger picture remains the same but you have to design the way that the piece fit themselves and make it all fit um, it's how the stimulus works like it's completely up to you how you're going to fit it in and you hold that power but that's why having a broad piece to begin with um, is always just going to be the goal um, so let's say using the provider stimulus as a central idea compose an opening and it's got this stimulus of the light bulb here and for this one we've got the fear um and then it's linking it to the piece um now this is a persuasive nature and you can write a persuasive text now i'm not actually sure and i'll ask you guys on the live chat who's doing a creative and who's doing a discursive you can do a persuasive um but it's not necessary um and it's not always assessed while well, creative has been assessed four out of four times so it is the safest option to do um these are just some um techniques that you can work through if you wanted to i just wanted to put them for anyone that wants them um but it's just using logic proof and reason to create your judgments and then building on the credibility but i just wanted to honestly put some stuff in here for you guys to have if anyone specifically was doing persuasive writing um but persuasive obviously is very different to discursive guys think back to napoleon seriously when i was in year 12 i was like i still don't know what a discursive was i was like wait a second persuasive you're proving it and you're trying to you've got this predetermined argument and you're like this is what you're going to do and you're going to believe me and this is why i'm going to convince you discursive is like a discussion on the discussion when we write discussions for napoleon you might have like two points for two points against and then the audience is left to decide which one they want to have their stance on. So you're presenting multiple arguments and opinions. That's the difference with discursive. You can do an informative, but again, it's not always specified. And I'm not very sure that anyone is planning on that. So personally, I'm going to slip this slide um, and this one. But in case you are thinking about it, it is an option. I've just never heard anyone say that they're considering it. Let's talk about reflective writing. So... You can get a 10 marker, you can get an 8 marker, you never know what it's going to be. If it's going to be a 10 marker, you should be spending 20 minutes on your creative and 20 minutes on your reflection because then you can hit the 40 minute timer. Do not rush your reflection, guys. Even if it's out of 5, it is very easy to get those marks there than it is to get full marks on the creative writing section. It is much, much easier. And I only say that because your reflection is kind of like a baby short answer. It's like a little short answer except you're hyping yourself up. And it's like, this is why my work is good. And you get to write it completely in the first person, um, which makes it easy to write too. And you're kind of like, oh, my clever metaphor here. I skillfully utilized a simile here and whatever. You would just continue. So this is an example of a reflection that you guys can use as a goal. Again, I wanted to just put stuff on here. Like, I'm not going to sit here and read the whole thing and bore you guys because I'm already talking so, so much. But this is more for anyone who's coming back to the lectures or who's downloading the slides if they want to be able to compare your reflection to someone else's and to just be able to look like, okay, what's an exemplar? What's mine at? What are they doing that I'm not? I think having others next to you is going to help a lot. Now, for constructing notes for Mod C, I definitely think that having some stuff on your prescribed text is so, so important because if you get a reflection and it is likely that you get one, is very very likely that they ask you in your prescribed text now for your prescribed text all you really have to say is that um the you are either going to be influenced by what your text is about so let's say you're doing the pedestrian it's very much about conformity and isolation and your text is also in conformity and isolation then you'd say conceptually i was inspired by it but if you're inspired by like maybe the use of metaphors or the use of similes 
or the use of repetition, then you're going to say that you were inspired stylistically to use the technique. And you can use the same technique and have the same effect, like um, if it's like a condescending tone to warn um, readers of the dangers of something, and you also do a condescending tone to warn the readers of the dangers of something, you can do that and show similarity. Or you can say, although this author, although um, Rowling uses an anecdote here for this purpose, I use an anecdote to instead do this and do like a different purpose of the technique. That's always a way that you can spice it up. Let's quickly talk about how to study for English. Um, creating and reading notes. Guys, there is so much online. And I really do credit um, my marks in English to honestly reading other people's essays. Like I don't care. I used other people's um, notes and I read a lot of other people's essays. And when they had a really good line that I liked, like I would write it down. And I was like, this is really good. And I want to try and incorporate this type of stuff into my work. Obviously, I'm not going to sit here and say steal other people's things ever. But I think exposing yourself to exemplar work just can really help motivate yourself. I know sometimes it's overwhelming because you're like, oh my gosh, my work is never going to sound like this. But I promise you, the more that you read other people's work and expose yourself, but also exposing yourself to Nessa feedback and the marker feedback and marking guidelines, it's just, it's just the goal. Writing thesis statements is so, so smart for you. I think if you are planning on memorizing an essay or going in with the draft and doing what I said that I did, writing thesis statement is killer because your thesis statements, you can write them to so many different questions. They'll maybe take you five minutes each. And in doing that, you can know, okay, this is how I'd answer that question. And if you struggle with it, then you can go back on it and you can ask your teacher about it, you can ask your friends about it, ask a sibling, whoever you can find about it. Writing essay plans is another thing. Essay plans really are just like um, your kind of like base essay, I guess, or like that draft essay that I said I did. And then writing full practice essays, again, you don't have to sit the full two-hour plus paper, but if you wanted to, nothing's stopping you. Um, a different way to structure your notes, you can do like just quotes, and I would do that. I had like one page of notes that was seriously just like a table with my quotes and then the technique. Um, personally, notes weren't working for me in English. Like, I couldn't do those tables. And then having, like, notes on, like, all the themes and stuff just didn't really help me. For me, what always worked with note-taking and, like, my English work was I knew for Common Mod, Mod A and Mod B that they're going to ask me a 20-mark essay. That's, that's all that they can ask. Like, that, that's all they're going to give you. I knew that. So, I was like, well, why am I going to memorize dot points and memorize and try and study with notes when I know that it's going to be assessed in this format? And that's why I studied with essays. And by writing a practice essay and then practicing that with so many different questions, um, that really helps as well. And you can also, like your notes can be paragraphs, like your notes can be essays. That's completely fine. Um, when I first started, and these were my T.S. Eliot ones for Mod B, as I was going in class, I had like notes like this where they were kind of dot pointed. But then as I got towards trials and HSC, my notes were literally just essays. So when I walked into my trials, I had like a, like a stapler of like my common mod essay then another thing of my mod a my mod b and then a stapled copy of like my different mod c's depending on what um question if it was 15 or 20 or 10 or 12 whatever it was that it was so going into the hsc and trials i think i had less than i put the text small i'll say it but i think i had less than 15 pages of notes altogether, and i had all four modules but that's only because i had worked on making a base that was so broad um and just so general because i had done a lot of module work as well and i'm so sorry that i sit here like defining like this is what a human experience is um at this early time in the morning but it just can make such a difference in your marks the module work and it's just so often ignored and it's such an easy way to get marks um and then before i would write my essay i'd kind of do like these essay plans where i'd kind of map out my thesis um because it's really hard to just like sit there and write like a full essay but if you have a plan and you're like okay these are the quotes i'm going to use this is like my first body paragraph this is my second this is what i'm going to say in my conclusion it can really just set up the goal for you and then right before my HSC and right before my trials, I transformed them to paragraphs and those paragraphs were really broad so I could fit them to a lot of things. So that's my advice. Again, up to you. You don't have to follow that. Personally, it worked for me and I was just memorizing my quotes, techniques, analysis, and then my topic sentences and my thesis. 
but realistically your thesis is going to be different for every single question i was just really trying to practice with different type of thesis ideas and this was some of my others and i was just writing practice essays um now for the common module unseen text section the best thing you can do for yourself is practice and honestly for the entire paper the best thing you can do for yourself is practicing as much as possible it's also very helpful to make a list or table of those techniques and i promise i will get on those as soon as i can and as soon as i'm finished up um with all the lectures but um just knowing some good techniques and their effects is definitely the way to go and the more practice questions you do for the common module unseen text the less you'll get thrown off because you'll kind of be used to it you kind of realize that a lot of the texts are really asking about the same general human experiences like it's very much about like discovery and growth and disconnection human connection and nature like it all kind of flows into it um in that way same for mod c i think the best way to prepare for it is to practice i think if you like choose a topic or you choose like a plot or a character that you really like and then try writing like a creative about it or try writing a discursive on it it's up to you personally i did not have a discursive planned i had like an idea and i was like you know what like if they give a discursive i'll write one um and i already had my idea and i was like i'm gonna write on this and i think i wrote it once like i wrote a first draft just to make sure i knew enough to write about it but i was really confident with my creative writing by the end of it because i had worked a lot and just tried my best to get also as many people as possible to read it i know it's horrifying to send your mod c to people it's like so humbling to sit there and read it and be like i'm gonna let other people see what a bad creative writer i am but the more people that read it and a lot of your friends can just give advice for what sounds cliche what to fix jackpot when you know when you know when you send it to someone and they they like instead of just leaving like a comment and being like oh this sounds cliche they put like comma instead do this and they say like even better ways that you can use your language that is the jackpot that is the absolute goal that we are aiming for now for trial approach and tips for memorizing quotes there are so many different things that you can do everybody's different personally for me reading them out like aloud was the only thing that was working and then what i would do i would like this is so mean to myself, but let's say I had like eight quotes to memorize for an essay. Um, I'd go through all eight. Um, I'd start with one and I'd memorize it. And once that was done, that was fine. Then I'd go to two, I'd memorize two. And then after two, I'd go back to one and then it was time to repeat one and two. Then if I got that right, I'm going to go to three. I'm going to learn three. Once I know three, repeat one, two, three. And you had to keep going. And then any time that I made a mistake, even if I was up to nine, I was like, no, like you need to know them in order. And it was really strict with myself and made me break down multiple times. Um, but it did work. It did work for memorizing and I could get memorizing done in an hour, um, which was really quick because it's very much active recall. Um, and another thing that I would do was writing them from memory. Um, and right before my HSC, I remember being at home, like right before I left for my HSC exams, the last thing I was doing for my English um, study was writing out all my quotes on a page and just making sure I could write them all out. I think that definitely makes a difference because you do want to make sure you know them. But some people like to make it into a song. Some people make flashcards. I had flashcards as well. That's how I was studying, but it's completely up to you. Make a study checklist. I promise you it is so good. Impose rewards and punishments for incentive. Find any excuse to buy yourself a gift. It doesn't matter. Um you can kind of be like okay this is what i want to do in week two or even if you want to study checklist and specifically like this is everything i have to do for advanced english this is everything i have to do for modern history this is everything i have to do for biology and you can just then spread it accordingly um i think especially for english and just being able to like make sure that you look at all the modules because it's so easy to just focus on paper one or it's so easy to just focus on mod c but again every section is worth 20 marks so if you know you're not good at mod c then yeah it's up to you in terms of sitting the paper in order it's also up to you um i like i said i don't think you should start a specific essay first and go out of order unless you are really not feeling confident with your quotes and you're like there's no way i'm going to remember this like i have no clue what's going on because then it is in your best interest to just start with the one that's freshest because you'd hope that like it would be freshest in your brain rather than like leaving it behind and then going in but it is completely up to you and then you want to simulate exam conditions, which guys, it's so hard. Like I said, I couldn't do it. Like I'd try and sit there to study, but then an hour later, I'd be like, snack time. I just have to watch like one episode. I'll just watch it one episode and I'll get back to it. And I never got back to it. So what you can do is gradually work towards exam conditions. So like I said, I think 
starting with like, okay, I'm going to sit two hour time. I'm going to do two essays and one creative. Great if you can do that, but you don't have to do that. You can start open book and untimed and do like a full paper and have all your notes out, have all your practice essays, whatever, and don't even do it under time conditions. Just do it. After that, you can try closed booked and untimed. So not having anything open, but just not timing yourself. Just let yourself write. Once you've done that, then you can go open booked but timed. And when it's open book and timed, you don't have time to look at the book. Like you've got to get moving. You've got to get moving. And then as a last resort, and then from then you can get to closed booked and timed. And stuff like this I believe in so much because I think that having just that high expectation is hard and it just increases the pressure. But if you know, like, okay, well, I'm going to see it a past past paper, but it's no time condition, it's just an open book, you don't have to feel guilty about that. There's nothing embarrassing about that. I did that so many times. I did so many past papers for my open book because I like was like I need the content right now and that actually helped me learn how to structure answering so it's not necessarily a bad thing either um, and give yourself less time when you're preparing so like I said if you've got 40 minutes to write your um, like mod ASA try to see if you can write it in 35 only because you want to give time for proofreading but also for mind blanks. I don't know if you guys also suffer from this, but I got it all the time in English Advance where I would literally just forget what I was saying. For a minute, just sit there like holding my pen, like what was my point? Like, oh, I was going to say something, I was going to say something and trying to remember. You want to give yourself the time and I feel like minimum two minutes, like try to get your essay to 35 to 38 minutes. So at least you have two minutes just so you finish it and so you can be confident in that. Otherwise, guys, look at me. I'm ending with a super, super emotional quote from my point, super motivational. But I really hope that you got a lot from this lecture. I hope that if the live chat was going off, then we were having a fun time and you guys got some from that as well. Again, you can download these slides if you want to come back to them. And I do recommend it only because I put on all those examples so you guys can come back to it if you ever want to compare or get some ideas. Um, but you can access this recording. You can access this recording for the rest of the year. So if you do need to come back or if there's a certain section or you're feeling a bit nervous from what's see right before and you just want some advice or you forget something from it, you're all good to come back. But I wish you guys all the best in trials and also in your HSC. I think it's so good that you guys signed up to come in your holidays to it. It's showing a lot of initiative. And because of that, I just... I just know. I just know you're all going to get in sixes. That's all good. I hope you guys enjoy the lecture and you're not too tired of my voice because I know I 100% am and me rubbing my eye half the time. Um, but have a good one, guys. All the best in your trials.